Welcome again. We're going to continue on with paper 173.3, Parable of the Two Sons. Let's go. 3. Parable of the Two Sons As the caviling Pharisees stood there in silence before Jesus, he looked down on them and said, Since you are in doubt about John's mission and arrayed in enmity against the teaching and the works of the Son of Man, give ear while I tell you a parable. A certain great and respected landholder had two sons, and desiring the help of his sons in the management of his large estates, he came to one of them, saying, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And this unthinking son answered his father, saying, I will not go. But afterward he repented and went. When he had found his older son, likewise he said to him, Son, go work in my vineyard. And this hypocritical and unfaithful son answered, Yes, my father, I will go. But when his father had departed, he went not. Let me ask you, which of these sons really did his father's will? And the people spoke with one accord, saying, The first son. And then said Jesus, Even so. And now do I declare that the publicans and harlots, even though they appear to refuse the call to repentance, shall see the error of their way and go on into the kingdom of God before you who make great pretensions of serving the Father in heaven, while you refuse to do the works of the Father. It was not you, the Pharisees and scribes, who believed John, but rather the publicans and sinners. Neither do you believe my teaching, but the common people hear my words gladly. Yeah, that's, um, that's powerful stuff. But it's also an incrimination to us, or a challenge to us in many, many cases. Why is that? Because the Lord's saying, if you're resistant to doing the will of your Father in heaven, do you in the end do it? That's better than if you said, okay, I'll go do it, and then you never do. Like that old saying, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. That's not entirely accurate, but it's somewhat accurate. Do you strive to do good and do good? Or do you just say, well, I'll do good, but then you don't? I'll go and do this, but then you won't. Do you even intend to ever do it? That's the, that's the point. Do you intend to do good? Do you intend to do what you feel the Lord wants you to do? If the answer to that is yes, then you're justified because other things got in the way. But strive to do that which you feel the Lord wants you to do. Don't let the world and things that will take up your time get in the way. Just go and do. Don't be afraid. Don't don't say, well, I'll do that tomorrow. Don't be like uh, Scarlett O'Hara on Gone with the Wind. Oh, I won't think about that today. I'll think about that tomorrow. No, no. <laughs> think about it today because there is no tomorrow. There's only today. There may be a tomorrow, but it'll be a today when it gets here. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Jesus did not despise the Pharisees and Sadducees personally. It was their systems of teaching and practice which he sought to discredit. He was hostile to no man, but here was occurring the inevitable clash between a new and living religion of the Spirit and the older religion of ceremony, tradition, and authority. All this time the twelve apostles stood near the Master, but they did not in any manner participate in these transactions. Each one of the twelve was reacting in his own peculiar way to the events of these closing days of Jesus' ministry in the flesh and each one likewise remained obedient to the Master's injunction to refrain from all public teaching and preaching during this Passover week. 4. Parable of the Absent Landlord When the chief Pharisees and the scribes who had sought to entangle Jesus with their questions had finished listening to the story of the two sons, they withdrew to take further counsel, and the Master, turning his attention to the listening multitude, told another parable. There was a good man who was a householder, and he planted a vineyard. He set a hedge about it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower for the guards. Then he let this vineyard out to tenants while he went on a long journey into another country. And when the season of the fruits drew near, he sent servants to the tenants to receive his rental. But they took counsel among themselves and refused to give these servants the fruits due their master. Instead they fell upon his servants, beating one, stoning another, and sending the others away empty-handed. 
and when the householder heard about all this, he sent other and more trusted servants to deal with these wicked tenants. And these they wounded and also treated shamefully. And then the householder sent his favorite servant, his steward, and him they killed. And still, in patience and with forbearance, he dispatched many other servants, but none would they receive. Some they beat, others they killed. And when the householder had been so dealt with, he decided to send his son to deal with these ungrateful tenants, saying to himself, They may mistreat my servants, but they will surely show respect for my beloved son. But when these unrepentant and wicked tenants saw the son, they reasoned among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and then the inheritance will be ours. So they laid hold on him, and after casting him out of the vineyard, they killed him. When the Lord of that vineyard shall hear how they have rejected and killed his son, what will he do to those ungrateful and wicked tenants? And when the people heard this parable and the question Jesus asked, they answered, He will destroy those miserable men and let out his vineyard to other and honest farmers who will render to him the fruits in their season. And when some of them who heard perceived that this parable referred to the Jewish nation, and its treatment of the prophets and to the impending rejection of Jesus and the gospel of the kingdom, they said in sorrow, God forbid that we should go on doing these things. It's interesting that um, this story was a portend of the future as well, because the wholesale destruction of the Jewish nation uh, culminated in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem as complete and utter destruction of the temple. And if you have any kind of fortitude to read Josephus and his account, I encourage you to do so, but you have to do so with a pretty strong stomach because it is a terrible account. And... Um, but that's, that's what happens, is that if we repeatedly reject the Lord, we repeatedly reject that which is good, right, and true, at some point the wicked will come and destroy the wicked. It's not the Lord that destroys you. It's somebody else who's just as wicked or worse than you comes and destroys you. As with the people of Ammonihah, once they had killed the people that were Christians and drove everybody else out, and locked up Alma and Amulek in prison, well, they were ripe for destruction. And the Lord didn't have to send down fire from heaven. What did he do? Well, you know, the Lamanites had a major defeat, and they decided they'd come around and they'd attack this other place, and they sure did. And um, they wiped out everybody, every man, woman, and child. That's pretty bad, but there you go. The Lord stopped the wickedness in its tracks so that it would not continue to propagate from generation to generation until it corrupted all around it. That's an important part of life is that if wickedness becomes systemic and ingrained, the Lord will allow the wicked to destroy themselves in order to stop the wickedness from propagating any further. Or else... All life will be lost on this planet. According to the Rancha book, there are worlds in darkness, utter darkness, not as advanced as ours, but nonetheless in complete darkness. How they get there? Because they chose evil rather than good. And at some point, procreation stops on that planet, and no more children are born there, and whoever's there on the planet remains until they die. We don't want that on this planet. It won't happen on this planet. It has the potential for it, but we also have Christ, who is the planetary prince of this planet, the default planetary prince on this planet, taking the place of Kalagosh in so many ways. Yeah, the devil's still here too, surely, because he hasn't he hasn't defaulted on every responsibility of the planetary prince, only in most of them. So he's going to continue to encourage us to go towards evil. Well, Christ is going to continue to encourage us to go towards good. Choose good, brothers and sisters. Choose good, my children. Choose good, not evil. Choose good, not error. 
choose good. Let's continue on. Jesus saw a group of the Sadducees and Pharisees making their way through the crowd, and he paused for a moment until they drew near him, when he said, You know how your fathers rejected the prophets, and you well know that you are set in your hearts to reject the Son of Man. And then, looking with searching gaze upon those priests and elders who were standing near him, Jesus said, Did you never read in the scripture about the stone which the builders rejected, and which, when the people had discovered it, was made into the cornerstone? And so once more do I warn you that, if you continue to reject this gospel, presently will the kingdom of God be taken away from you and be given to a people willing to receive the good news and to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. And there is a mystery about this stone, seeing that whoso falls upon it while he is thereby broken in pieces shall be saved. But on whomsoever this stone falls, he will be ground to dust and his ashes scattered to the four winds. When the Pharisees heard these words, they understood that Jesus referred to themselves and the other Jewish leaders. They greatly desired to lay hold on him then and there, but they feared the multitude. However, they were so angered by the Master's words that they withdrew and held further counsel among themselves as to how they might bring about his death. And that night both the Sadducees and the Pharisees joined hands in the plan to entrap him the next day. 5. Parable of the Marriage Feast After the scribes and rulers had withdrawn, Jesus addressed himself again to the assembled crowd and spoke the parable of the wedding feast. He said, the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a certain king who made a marriage feast for his son and dispatched messengers to call those who had previously been invited to the feast to come, saying, Everything is ready for the marriage supper at the king's palace. Now many of those who had once promised to attend at this time refused to come. When the king heard of these rejections of his invitation, he sent other servants and messengers, saying, Tell all those who were bidden to come, for behold, my dinner is ready. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all is in readiness for the celebration of the forthcoming marriage of my son. But again did the thoughtless make light of this call of their king, and they went their ways, one to the farm, another to the pottery, and others to their merchandise. Still others were not content thus to slight the king's call, but in open rebellion they laid hands on the king's messengers and shamefully mistreated them, even killing some of them. And when the king perceived that his chosen guests, even those who had accepted his preliminary invitation and had promised to attend the wedding feast, had finally rejected his call and in rebellion had assaulted and slain his chosen messengers, he was exceedingly wroth. And then this insulted king ordered out his armies and the armies of his allies and instructed them to destroy these rebellious murderers and to burn down their city. And when so, yeah, that's the story of the wedding feast, but it's interesting that um, these, these people were not royalty that were invited. These people were just the everyday working people they invited to come, and they had previously accepted. It's not like they'd said, um, yeah, I can't make it, sorry. That, that would have been fine, but these these were invited and they had accepted. So when the time came, he's like, let's go, Let's we're all having it, it's come... And they just re they spurned them. And they, they treated the, the, the messengers badly, which would be the prophets, and uh, did not want to come to the merry feast of the sun, which is the bestowment of the sun upon a planet. They didn't want to come. They didn't want to participate. They wanted to kill them, maybe, but they didn't want to be a part of it. So, yeah. He ordered out, uh, you know, the armies and armies of his allies and instructed him to destroy his rebellious murders and burn down their city. So, uh, yeah, we kind of, um, we saw that, with the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jews scattered everywhere. Um, let's, let's not be the same. Let's not be so hung up on what we feel Messiah is and what Messiah's second coming will be. That we cannot see that the Lord is, number one, already among us. He is among us. He will remain among us. He will not leave us. He has never left us, and he will not leave us until we come to an era of light and life.
Yes, we're in a contest right now in a planet of good and evil between good and evil, between Christ and the devil. Christ will win. Good will win. But do not mistake for a moment that you know how that's going to play out. You may know some things, but I think we don't know more than we really think we know. We, we know less than we really know about what the Lord has in mind because he deals with a lot of subtleties, a lot of small things that come and break down the big. And we don't see it coming. We never see it coming. But he has the power to do so. And he will when the time is right. But he's not going to come in glory to save us from evil. Because if he came in glory and we weren't committed to the path and doing it, we would be destroyed with them. That's not the way it works. The Lord has to get enough people willing and actually trying to live a life similar to a light in life life in order to make that change happen. And that means accepting the Lord's few commandments as the challenge in your life to love one another as, as I have loved you. That's his biggest challenge. We need to find a way to love others no matter what the difference is. We don't have to compromise. We just have to find a way to love them and be willing to find that path with everyone. It's really hard, but it can be done. I'll leave it there. Thank you again. Take care.